Oh boy. All right, thank you very much uh, for turning up. Um, before I start, I'd like to uh, um, apologize. We're a little short, in fact, we're short of one member of our panel. Uh, Yao Zhang, unfortunately, um, was not able to get her visa in time and so has not been able to uh, come here. Well, visa problems are always an issue when uh, you have such a large conference with so many people from so many different places. Um, but we're very happy to have um, three people with an extensive experience and a deep understanding of how technology is changing workforces and uh, are with us today. The title of the panel is, I think, one of these sort of cool titles we give things these days, um, Chrome Collar, the future of work, right? Now, um, let's focus on the second half of that title because I'm still confused about the first. Um, the, the larger questions that we are looking at here are essentially, uh, I think, now well understood. Um, if you told someone like me, I'm, I'm now uh, 40, when I was growing up that, you know, I might have to change jobs several times, hold down several different jobs simultaneously, I would think that this is a very, very dark and dystopian future that you're painting for me, right? It was expected, and we were just talking about this, um, that when you grew up, you would get a degree, and then you would be working in a company for your entire life for something vaguely related to the thing that you got your degree for. We are fairly certain now that this is no longer true. And that is the impact on, on for want of a better word, what the uh, leftists now in America are calling the, the PMC, the professional and managerial class. The impact on blue collar workers is different and it is different in different parts of the world depending upon what, what the initial state are, uh, states are. And so to think through what, uh, what these impacts are, what we uh, can be doing about it, what companies should be uh, preparing for, and what governments, both federal and local, uh, should be thinking about at this time of change for workforces. We've got three people from three different parts of the world um, talking together today. Um, first on my left, uh, Silvana Lopez is, uh, runs a blockchain-based startup and is based out of, of Boston now? Yeah. Yes, but, but has a lot of, does a lot of work in, in Latin America as well. Um, Gotham Shroff, um, on her right, is uh, Vice President and Chief Scientist of TCS, which, as he pointed out today, now employs 450,000 people across the world. So, uh, and it is India's largest employer after Indian Railways, probably. Um, so this is a big, big company one at the cutting edge of, uh, of the digital world and also uh, you know, one transitioning its own workforce through uh, from what was the third industrial revolution to the fourth. And um, finally, uh, on, on my extreme right, I have uh, Koketso from South Africa, a friend of mine. And uh, she works for ATK, but she has an enormous amount of experience about how um, Africa and the Middle East are preparing uh, for this revolution. Um, and I'm going to ask her to lead us off uh, with uh, a sort of discussion and sort of set the frames of the discussion for us, if you don't mind. Thank you, Mahir. Um, as, thank you very much to the ORF, first of all, for having me back. It's always wonderful to be part of your uh, events and particularly your panels. So, Mahir, I think you started us off quite nicely by saying, you know, the, what we do has changed. And if anybody um, knows what I'd like to talk about, you know that I'd like to talk in industrial revolutions. <laughs> so here we go again. So I think the first and the second um, revolutions introduced to us the idea of the factory as a workplace. So we went into then um, automated uh, factory lines that people started working in. In the second industrial, in the third industrial revolution, sorry, we then started to use the computer as a tool. And in both of these cases, the things that we did changed, but also how we did changed. We are now looking at um, a similar kind of scale of change right now. With the proliferation of the internet, 
um, increasing use of robotics and artificial intelligence and things that I'm sure Silvana will talk about in blockchain. Um, we are now at a moment in time where things will change at the same scale as we did in those first two uh, examples I gave. Now the other thing that's happening is that people are changing, right? We're starting to throw words around like a portfolio of careers and flexibility and more creativity, much to the horror of my parents' generation. <laughs> we're, we're demanding to do things very differently to how we used to do it before. Now these two changes together have presented us with this wonderful problem called the future of work. We don't quite know yet what, what exactly this will look like, so I can't sit here and tell you that go tell your children to study XYZ to become an XYZ professional. We don't quite know yet. But as it evolves, the World Economic Forum did this wonderful study which looked at what kind of skills we'll need uh, going forward. These are things like problem solving and analytics, increased um, creativity, uh, ability to interact with customers more closely, Effectively, what it's saying is that we need to be a little bit more agile and we need to solve problems that um, robotics and automation don't necessarily solve for us. So in order to get ahead in this new future of work, we need to be able to develop a, a different set of skills to what we call um, careers today. Right. The second question for me then becomes, is this um, future of work equal or is this future of work available to everyone? And the simple answer is no. So we can break this down a few different ways. In developing and developed markets, there's a difference. So in countries like your Germany, your Spain, your UK, where they have large programs around the fourth industrial revolutions looking at how to transform their economies and therefore skill people and enable people to have access to markets um, in, in a way that, that matches this change um, of, of the future, there is a very different reality to developing countries. Countries like mine, where the, the prevalent um, uh, working industries are your mining and manufacturing, where people can't necessarily very quickly um, adopt these new skills and new technologies um, who don't have necessarily the infrastructure to access um, those technologies, might be left behind going forward. It's very easy for me to, to sit here and say, well, I no longer work for um, a management consulting firm and I'm independent and I use platforms online. Um, then somebody who works in a mining company um, and is a rigger at, at a platinum mine in South Africa is a very different uh, paradigm for them. So the question then becomes, how do we, or how does government, local and national, start to integrate these people and start to transform their economies to ensure that everybody is included going forward. As I said earlier, developed countries have started to really drive um, at these changes. They have implemented things like Production 2030 in Sweden, um, Spain's Industry 4.0, where they're integrating people from academia, from business, from um, civil society to start thinking around the questions of legislation, policies, um, you know, innovation questions um, that they need to answer in order to transform their economies. In emerging markets, the story is slightly different. From a national government sense, for me, what we need to start looking at is strategically, what are the skills that would make sense for us to start to, to adopt or to start to look into um, going forward? What are the kind of policy changes or legislative changes do we need to look at in order to enable companies uh, like Sylvanas to operate and that become the platform for skills change um, in our economies? R strategically, regionally, how do we speak to our neighbors or speak um, to our trading partners to have them or to have, to have partnerships that allow us to move forward um, in our economies and transform our economies that our countries aren't, you know, don't remain as the call centers of the world or the tourism hubs and move on um, to be knowledge economies like everyone else. From a local government perspective, I see their role more as an ex execution role. They are on the ground, they have the base of information, the base of knowledge, and they're in touch with the communities and what I see them being part of is really feeding into the national government, but becoming the, the, the execution arm 
of where infrastructure needs to go, what kind of skills people um, are more interested in. So when we talk about the future of work, for me, there are really you know, the two things we need to realize. Number one is that it's certainly changing, and it's certainly changing at a fast pace. But secondly, this change is not necessarily equal for all. And in order, particularly for emerging markets, to participate in this change, national and local government needs to be involved along with, together with, uh, other actors um, in, in, the, in the ecosystem to make sure that we, are, we participate, not only as individuals in this future of work, but as transforming economies to make sure that we, all, we are all, um, there's an inclusive participa participation um, in, this, um, uh, in this revolution, so to say. Thank you. It's, it seems to me that, you know, uh, there was a conversation maybe a decade and some ago about differences in access uh, to the digital world. And that conversation has deepened and become more urgent. And it's now, as you say, about participation. Because, you know, there is activity that you're being left out and not just information. Um, and that's something that we need to, to focus on. Um, Gautam, could you, could you take this uh, on and tell us a little bit about... Um, what the sort of technological changes that we're looking at here are, how they impact individual choices of professions and what, what people do in their jobs, and, and for example, what your company is doing about, about it. Yeah. Can we go next? Okay. Uh, yeah, so <coughs> the future of work, uh, firstly, why are we talking about it? I think the, it's quite clear that the, this conversation begins with all the... Uh, hype and fears about artificial intelligence and the, many of those uh, questions are real. So let me give a technical perspective in as simple terms as possible. Uh, what's happening, if you look at the bell curve of say human intellectual ability, there's the high end where there's creativity, deep technical expertise, and there's the low end where it's primarily one's physical and uh, perceptual skills which are being used. Right? And in the middle is where much of the movement since the Second World War uh, of people who are economically less fortunate uh, to become more fortunate, they're creating the middle class. So the middle is where their people are not excessively creative but they don't want to necessarily work with their hands either. And that middle class of quote unquote knowledge workers, bank clerks, compliance executives, even uh, uh, data entry, call center is also a middle class in many ways in India. Uh, that, that class is going to fundamentally get uh, decelerated because much of that technology much of those work uh, pieces can actually be automated. So that, I'll come back to that problem. So there, there is going to be a squeezing of the middle, and that's much more prevalent uh, in the developed world, where if you think about uh, a large corporation, uh, say a large manufacturing company, a large bank, and think about the organizational pyramid that they have, and ask the question, how many of those uh, quote-unquote jobs are fundamentally automatable, uh, you'll come up with large number. And, but look at the other side, that, that, f that pyramid in all those large corporations is sustaining a huge consuming class, which is driving the sales uh, of the very things that those companies manufacture. So that cycle can have a positive or a negative, uh, 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 you know, sort of uh, vicious or virtuous cycle of, of, of growth or, or shrinkage. And that's the challenge. We have to make sure that we, we don't go into a recession driven by automation. Uh, and, and many people have written about it. Now, coming to India, I think the situation is rather different. Uh, I was on the first committee of, uh, set up by the government on artificial intelligence, uh, which was kind of two years ago. Uh, and one of the questions the minister asked us uh, at the very beginning is, please talk about jobs in your report, and we did. And the, 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 we made three important, uh, I think we think important uh, comments. One is that uh, clearly productivity enhancement through automation is going to improve uh, 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 
job creation simply because uh, uh, of the standard economic argument of imp improved productivity means improved business, means improved growth, et cetera, et cetera. So it'll, it'll drive growth. But that's going to be one part of the puzzle only. Uh, a bigger question is going to be what kinds of jobs will be created by artificial intelligence. And one uh, is going to be on simply uh, uh, data tagging or cognitive skills. And that, that, that part has already started. It's a low-end job, just tagging images or tagging audio with various uh, things which just because we're <laughs> human, we can understand. But there's another much more important piece of the puzzle, which is service delivery and access. In a country like India, most of the population has uh, a serious problem getting access to essential services, whether it be health, a farmer to information uh, or to the right pesticide or uh, in education, people to know what, uh, how to get educated. Language is a barrier, digital access is a barrier, digital skills is a barrier, and there are many others. So the, uh, the ability of the so-called gig, gig, gig economy or the Uber economy to address these questions is huge. Uh, we, already, al al we already see drivers uh, getting uh, employed because they're on a platform, right? Uh, similarly for carpenters and similarly for other labor markets. Now, when, when you look at that market, it, the, the opportunity for transformation is huge. In the rural areas, the challenge is, of course, digital access, uh, liter digital literacy, and the incentives for actually creating that demand. And that is probably where we need to do to think much more. So for example, uh, we did uh, in the Kolar uh, area of Karnataka, there was a, uh, uh, an experiment that was conducted together with the Na National Rural Health Mission by TCS, where we empowered the ASHA workers, the, uh, uh, who were essentially the health uh, connect uh, from the hosp local hospitals to the actual people with digital infrastructure so that they would actually be entering patient data and then after some time they were actually not only entering patient data but giving uh, uh, first level uh, directions as to what should be the next thing they should do before actually making a trip to the hospital. All because the digital platform enabled that data and recommendations to come to them. They, from a social perspective, these workers, mo many, most of them women, suddenly felt that from being uh, quote unquote worker class, they had actually become digital because they used a tablet. And now they enter, the, 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 at the lower end, they enter the middle <coughs> class. Their incomes go up. The same thing happens anytime you <coughs> IT enable a function. We, the TCS has IT enabled many functions over the years, and the call center being the obvious example which gets you mentioned, uh, and that sort of brings people into the quote unquote middle class. Uh, it, but <coughs> along with that, which is something which we're doing for the rest of the world. Uh, we can also do this for service delivery in large parts of the country. And what's required for that is for the leadership, uh, whether it's in the government or in the NGOs, to become digitally literate and AI literate uh, and understand the potential of these platforms and for the startup economy to realize these platforms throughout the country. Now, what is required from, uh, for, from a government intervention perspective? I think there are three fundamental things. One is we do, and I think the previous panel early in the morning must have addressed some of the questions. We need to get data privacy right. If we don't get it right, we're not going to get these platforms actually uh, accepted, even though privacy might be a low concern <laughs> at the lower end, but it will become an important concern once it starts being misused, and it will be. So we need to get data privacy right. The second thing, is we need to have democratization of education. Uh, I, uh, in 2012, uh, very early days of the MOOC uh, phenomena, uh, I was one, the first uh, academic from India, though I'm not really an academic, but I'm, I'm, I'm an adjunct at IIT, so I, through that platform, I ran a, a MOOC on Coursera. Uh, about 40,000 people registered, ran three times, 150,000. A fantastic experience, but what I realized is that it's not the access to the education. There are two things missing in this model. One is assessment, 
and second is physical and direct interaction with students. Both of these areas uh, require human intervention, uh, direct human, and that's another huge area where if we are able to democratize access to education, not restrict it to people who have to get admission to select universities or select programs, but democratize assessment and democratize recruitment. We've started this uh, this year uh, instead of going, in addition to going to campuses, we have the national qualifier test where anybody with a certain, uh, certain requirements is able to apply for a national qualifier test and then they get interviewed for uh, potential hiring into TCS. Uh, instead of going to campuses and that being the only way we get things in. So democratization of assessment and, and recruitment. And the government also has to probably be much more liberal in making online education uh, and the regulations around it uh, much more flexible. And the third thing is whether it's in education or healthcare or all other regulated areas, we need to create regulatory sandboxes, uh, which was uh, so that these kind of experiments can take place uh, without be opening it up to misuse. In fact, the uh, few years back, the RBI report on uh, household finance said that what we need in financial inclusion is regulatory sandboxes so that household finance at the rural levels at the small town levels can get addressed through creative mechanisms without being burdened by much of the banking regulations which sort of prevent a lot of innovation today. Uh, and, and lastly, I think the future of work is, is not, we can say it's all uh, uh, fantastic, the gig economy, people have many jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's fundamentally also very disturbing uh, because it's the comfort of the middle uh, where one actually has an educated job, one creates a middle class, one creates a consuming class, uh, one creates a class which can think about the future uh, without worrying about the present too much, which drives uh, a country forward. We need a new middle class, we need a new type of middle class, but also one which is equally educated and not only skilled. So I don't view this as a, as a done deal it is a challenge, there are opportunities, but there are also fundamental challenges. Thank you. You know, I think it's one of the interesting things about uh, <coughs> this particular change in technology um, and the fourth industrial revolution, as, as, as people are calling it, um, that unlike the previous industrial revolution, so I say the first revolution, steam engines and so on and so forth, you know, destroyed handmade manufacturers and artisans and so on and so forth, uh, you know, Surge took out, you know, stenographers. But uh, this one, if it is, you know, if it lives up to its potential, if AI and machine learning live up to their potential in particular, will take out a lot of people who thought, uh, who, you know, for the first time attacked white collar workers, essentially. And um, the political implications of the middle class turning Luddite, all right, and turning anti-technology and anti-progress uh, because of their own pocketbooks has not been sufficiently thought through. So far, technological change has always worked and has always had, uh, you know, has never been held back effectively because the people who's on whom the disruption has fallen have been blue collar workers or agricultural workers. This time, the disruption is people like us and the professional and managerial classes. I have to return to that phrase again. And so the, the, the political implications of this are something that I think all of us will need to think about going forward, or at least they'll be visible to us uh, going forward. Um, Silvana, where does uh, uh, technology come in? How can technology help organize workers, give them access to information, you know, have them, you know, pre-existing co collectives maybe, how can they be empowered and brought into this, uh, into this new uh, 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 revolutionary phase? Thank you uh, for your question, and thanks for the ORF to having me, for having me again this year. And I'm glad the GDPR conversation is still going on. And to answer to your question, first of all, I actually have a confession to make. Some of the things I'm gonna say here, I actually never thought of them before. So this has been a great opportunity to think things uh, coming from an entrepreneurial background. And uh, so long story short, 
um, you go to MIT, you learn all these great things on entrepreneurship, and then you get out of MIT and you're really anxious to build the next cool thing. But you never stop to think what this next cool thing and the implications of it is going to have on the world particularly on emerging, emerging worlds such as the ones we have in, in Latin America, which I'm sure there's many similarities to the difficulties that we have in countries such as uh, India. So um, for me, like the future of work is been driven by three megatrends, which is first the globalization, the digi digitalization and demographic change. What does it mean? that there is a big fear of the loss of jobs because of technological changes, which is true. And it's one of the, characteristic, of the characteristics of the uh, fourth revolution in which we have the substitution of capital for labor. Um, so when you have cheaper and better digital technologies, that brings a change into demographics transportation costs lower, communication costs lower, which means people have more access to things that didn't came for. But with this, we have to face and we have to be conscious of what does these demographic changes uh, mean to either uh, advance uh, economies in advanced countries and also in the emerging worlds. Because for th those two types of countries, you have two types of very different consequences. With this whole change of demographics due to the future of work and people uh, getting skills in new technologies such as blockchain, and I'll get into that uh, a bit later, you have two different consequences. First, for the advanced countries, you have the risk of people being left out. This is aging people, like myself, uh, can be easily, uh, you know, uh, left behind in terms of if we don't upgrade, if we don't maintain our skills, then we're, it, it evolves so fast that we're going to be left out for this new whole market. In the emerging world, that is not even a problem because there are some people that don't even have access to that market. And we have to be aware of this. And this is part of the challenge that I have to face. And I didn't thought of it too much uh, when building the platform that I'm building. Um, so what are some of the statistics right now? In the US, for example, <laughs> we're talking one of the most advanced economies, 47% um, of the people doing jobs right now are gonna be substituted within 10 years either by a computer or different types of algorithms. In Germany, uh, we have 59% uh, of people that will be in, in Europe Overall, it goes from 45 to 60 percent, so that's a large amount of people. And this is on the advanced economies. So answering to your questions a bit, and uh, with all these new technologies, there comes a responsibility. So we have blockchain, we have machine learning, we have AI. How can we make this new technology um, real life use cases for people to have access to skills and education? Um, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to say is that we can lose perspective of what kind of skills are going to be needed and rewarded um, within the, let's say, upcoming next 10 years. Um, you would think that the first skills are going to be technological skills, where there's a surprise here. One of the skills that are going to be most rewarded in terms of the future of work are actually soft skills. This is leadership, this is communication. You have to have those skills to have a driven, um, a driven economical and technological change. And also, of course, as a second place, you have uh, digital skills in which, and, uh, and here's an interesting um, uh, statistic on blockchain, 90% of the jobs needed for blockchain and that are going to be needed within the next five to 10 years are not occupied. There's a scarcity on blockchain talent. Um, one of the things that uh, we're trying to build, and again, uh, I, I want my focus on this conversation come from an entrepreneurial person that's building a, a, a digital platform. So I want to be transparent onto that. Um, 
there is almost no blockchain. I mean, uh, there's a lot of hype and buzz on blockchain, but it, what is actually being built and done there? Um, so what we're trying to do is, is, is build a platform in which people actually get blockchain skills. And with that, um, I want to address uh, a question that Coqueto here uh, did to me when we were before in the panel having a discussion. And uh, she asked me, how do you make sure what you're building is gonna benefit or people with, uh, that, um, that come from the emerging world and under critical conditions will have access to? Well, I still owe you that answer, actually. And that is a responsibility I have. I'm, I should be able to answer Coquetso that question. Because one of the responsibilities that us in entrepreneurship has is to become part of the solution, not part of the problem. So that's why um, I started with this confession that some of the things that I'm actually saying, I, I, I never stopped to think about them before. And this is a great exercise. Um, in terms of government, and I'm going to be focusing more on, on emerging worlds coming from Latin America. So you have the national and local governments, which I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate. In most countries, it's kind of the same. Um, so the government, let's say national government, should have a role of a strategic ally for this type of uh, platforms, for this type of players in this new uh, fourth revolution. The government has a responsibility to ensure that with the, what comes with the future of work won't bring more inequality because that's one of the most vulnerable characteristics of the future of work. You have people that are very vulnerable that is gonna be easily um, left out or will never have any access at all to a, a, a job market. More of, moreover, if you're talking, even more, if you're talking about the globalization of economy, if you have people offshore coming to hire, or, you know, they're, they're not gonna have access for that. So, what are the responsibilities of governments? Governments should be able to design public policies that are gonna be able to, A, prepare young people for, you know, the upcoming uh, jobs, and also ensure that the aging people have all the tools and all the access to maintain their skills and upgrade in them. Um, also, you have to be able to design through these policies, policies a proper labor market institution. What does this mean? That you have to have and design the proper regulation to be sure that these new jobs that are coming with the future of work won't become a risk for having poor uh, remuneration, poor salaries, or poor working conditions. That is a huge risk. And it's a risk that it's even much more present with vulnerable uh, communities and minorities, uh, which is a whole other subject <laughs> that we may later get into. Also, social security systems. I, I, when you know developing this platform, I never thought about it. Of course, there has to be a social security system that's going to be enabled, that will be able to protect all these um, uh, people that are going to be participating in, let's say, remote. Uh, so let's say you're working remotely. Let's say offices are not needed anymore. You, it's a, in, in Latin America when things are not formalized, you run the risk of uh, jumping into these holes that uh, become a gray zone, and then, you know, you don't know how to address them. So let's say in Latin America, the future of work, people will work remotely from their houses. You, as a government, have to make sure they are properly protected and that uh, informalization won't become uh, part of the characteristics of these uh, remote uh, offices. Um, also, uh, one of the most important things that these public policies should have is to strengthen activation networks. This means a lot of uh, people are going to move from their jobs easily. That's a very big possibility. So you have to be able, as a government, to ensure that uh, if someone loses their job because of all these demographic changes, um, they're going to be able to find a job 
easily enough and quick enough. And last but not least, and this is really important, there has to be a social dialogue policy. You have to be able as a government to listen to minorities and underrepresented populations, and also to encourage the conversation among the different players in the industries, among um, the different type of employers with their employees. So that, I wanna, I wanna leave you with that. Coqueto, I, I really hope to be able to answer to your question soon, soon enough. Right, I'm gonna be trying to open for questions in a few minutes, but before that, uh, you know, one of the things, and you know, to summarize a, a lot of what we heard uh, uh, from our three speakers, there is a constant concern about, uh, that ran, a thread of concern that ran through these uh, three interventions about the creation of, in some senses, a, a two-speed, two-level economy, right? Um, where there are some people who are left out of access to jobs in the future, um, that they may or may not be able to possess the digital skills to keep up or to participate, um, that they will be, uh, you know, rendered informal, um, as Silvana worried, um, and that there are various uh, ways in which we need to ensure that this two-speed economy doesn't sort of take hold. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to ask the sort of uh, speakers to expand on what are the ways in which we can ensure that this doesn't happen. But also, I'd like them to speculate about what this means for social organization and for politics going forward. Um, the last thing Silvana said is that we need more dialogue. Traditionally, dialogue in many parts of the world has come from parties that rep or you know, political parties or groups or interest groups that represent you know, professions, trade unions. It is created around what you do. How you participate in the public sphere is frequently a product of, of uh, where your place is in the modern economy. In, a mo in, 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 in the economy of the coming decades, you may not be able to organize on that basis. You may be sitting at home, you may be on a platform, and the other people who have the same interests as you are not people that you see every day, are not people that you live next to, are not people that you can therefore create common interests with. How do we imagine this social, you know, a, 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 a future in which we can create the kind of discussion that leads to a one-track economy when you can't imagine a social dialogue in this very atomized world? Go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to pick up actually from somewhere where Gautam mentioned earlier um, before I answer your question, which is, you know, one of the ways to solve the problem is that the leaders themselves need to become digitally literate. When Mark Zuckerberg was hauled in front of Congress um, a few years ago on the, um, on the uh, Cambridge Analytica issue, um, one of the main critiques of that entire session was that the very leaders who were questioning him didn't even understand what they were questioning him about, which is, <laughs> which is a problem, right? So if, and if we all look into the rooms of um, the governments who represent us, can we really say they're any more literate than um, that Congress that day was? So for me, the, the question of how do we ensure dialogue, dialogue going forward is to make sure that we're part of the dialogue today. How many of us in this room belong to professional bodies like um, the Institute of Accountants or Institutes of Engineers or whatever institute um, your profession um, is part of? But how many of us actually go to those meetings? Hmm. I'm looking around the room and I'm, <laughs> ah, one, <laughs> one in the whole room. So one of the things I realized is that when government needs to talk about changes or developments in certain areas that they need to make policy changes for, these are the bodies that they are consulting to do that. Yet, you and I here sitting in this room are not part of those conversations to begin with. So I'm not asking people to become, to become government, to, to become politically involved, but what I think a very real thing we can do from tomorrow is to become part of those um, conversations by being active in those communities that already exist for us today. Thanks, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, See, uh, I'll take it in two uh, pieces. One is, uh, I'll come to uh, Mir's question in a minute, but if you think about government, in, we have traditionally been brought up, at least uh, from my generation, that one of the primary functions of government is to provide employment. 
and that may as well uh, may well remain true but the way the government provides employment perhaps needs uh, uh, some adjustment the linkage between the employment provide and the provided and the work that work getting done is tenuous at best and uh, in some sense when local government starts using platforms to get the garbage cleaned to get things repaired uh, that's when the change would have happened and that's why i kind of uh, i don't i don't not very pessimistic i'm 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 not that pessimistic about this because the the pros one of the things that we did recommend as the, in that ai committee report is that education of the governing class is critical and i think that that keeps happening i i was speaking at the civil services day and the prime minister also spoke and the reason they convened these meetings with the bdos and the collectors all in the room uh, is so that they can hear and they can their imagination can go wild and start using these platforms another thing that we did for many years five years we ran it the digital impact square in nashik right where we uh, uh, tcs as a company funded a uh, bunch of startups uh, for a period of like 6 months to 18 months uh, full salaries give them whatever they need and connect them to the municipality and say look these are the guys who are going to give you tell you the things that you could do by creating such platforms and you create the platforms we'll we'll pay you so you don't have to worry about your security and then the intellectual property is yours and after that good luck to you that was a social service that we did these initiatives will connect people the young people with the ideas and the technology with the people whose task uh, is to to govern and get things done uh, and many more such initiatives are, are required so that's that's the first part of my answer second question is this two level economy is a, is a problem uh, in the sense that there there are the creatives Uh, and they are the, those people who are going to execute, and platforms will connect them. People are building, or uh, perhaps designing clothes. Many young entrepreneurs are doing that: boutique clothing, uh, food. Many people are doing, and people are exploring the platforms to get the right people. Connect. The challenge I see is not this. The economics will work out, but as a society, if you don't have a large, educated, forward-thinking, value-creating middle class. uh then uh, we have a small middle class with the creatives who are reaping the large profits the large ones who are executing in the platform then yes they will get jobs they'll get work they'll get access all that will happen but if you go one step beyond for a country to mature we do need the liberal arts we need the judiciary we need educated leaders who can think about the future of the country not now but 50 100 years from now uh and i think the, th the telling point is that the, the london underground was built 150 years ago i'm to think that time when there was hardly there was no electricity that we are going to have underground railways i mean we have to think this far ahead who is going to think this far ahead unless we have that educated middle class in large numbers and i don't have an answer to this because the gig economy of the creatives and the and and the and the exec executors connect by platform doesn't re leave room for that middle and we can't afford that middle being created the way the west has created with essentially a large set of white collar workers uh, attending meetings and having conversations uh, because that profit the profits that they make are are driving it we don't we can't afford that 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 the large number of organized uh, middle class people and this is probably our biggest challenge yeah. thank you mm -hmm. um yeah so um again speaking from uh an entrepreneurial point of view which is totally the opposite of <laughs> a, a political point of view i'm going to say that we do have a social responsibility uh for in all of this and one of the most solid manifestations of that social responsibility we have uh with this whole future of work context and the use of new technologies is and I, i want to bring this uh uh point that gotham was mentioning is intellectual property i'm an intellectual property lawyer myself so this is one of the things that we really take care uh when when we thought about building this platform which is catalyzed by hackathons one of the things first things i told my co-founder is i want to be really fair on hackathons and i i was telling you before the netflix story which uh 
you know, on a very high level, Netflix, I don't know if you're aware of this, but one of the first algorithms they actually developed was through a hackathon. And the price that they paid for the winner was, uh, which is the price that they paid for the algorithm actually, was I think, um, if there's someone in the audience of Netflix, feel free to correct me, uh, about $1 million. That was the price they paid for that first algorithms. So their premise was to pay a fair price for the technology that was being developed, even if it was a hackathon. And that's one of the things, since hackathons are becoming this new trend of uh, companies for developing technology or for finding talent, they have to be fair on what they're paying for that technology because you cannot start messing up with the prices of technology if you're using all these new ways uh, to innovate and if you're uh, into open innovation. You have to be fair and that's, where, that's one of the main aspects, uh, intellectual property, that um, are one of the main manifestations of social responsibility that new platforms must always uh, bear in mind and have into account. Thank you. Now, um, I'm going to be uh, throwing into, I mean, I have a lot of questions left, uh, which I'd like to take to the panel, but I think we have about 14 minutes left, and I want to see if there are any questions in the audience. And uh, there's a gentleman already at the microphone, so we'll go with him. Okay. Uh, thank, you. thank you, panelists, for, for very insightful discussions. Uh, I'm uh, Alok Chaturvedi. I'm a professor of management and computer science at Purdue University. So I would like to challenge you guys a little bit more because the trend which we are seeing in United States and also in European Union and in many regards, you know, Gotham had alluded to this point is that we are beginning to see a U-curve in terms of uh, uh, employment. The, you know, the low-skill jobs, so there's a lot of low-skill jobs and there's a lot of high-skill jobs. So the problem which is coming with is in the mid-skill jobs. And mid-skills jobs are, you know, that is where most of the population is, and that has direct implications on election results. And we are, we are seeing that, that around the world. So my question to, to the panel is that as we are driving more AI and the, the type of, of problem it is going to create, then how can the future jobs are going to be impacted? Because we have to fundamentally rethink how the jobs are being created and what is, the, what is going to be the nature of the economy. So it is not two-paced economy. So this is where, you know, high talent economy versus, you know, people who are being left behind. So that is my question. How do you tackle, how are you going to tackle that Thank issue? You. We'll take one or two more. Um, the gentleman at this microphone, please go ahead. Like, hello. I'll come to you, yes. My name is Rajiv Saxena. Uh, the question is for like, Madam Silvana. Lopez. Uh -huh. uh, I've been to actually Colombia and where I worked for three months and I wrote the IT policies of, of Colombia. And uh, I've seen the working of uh, most of the, the Latin American uh, nations. Uh, I read your profile where you which mentioned that you are from the blockchain challenge. I want to know if there's any case studies available in Latin American countries on the blockchain and how it has affected the economy and what are the challenges which you have faced in implementation of the blockchain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question from the young gentleman at yes, the back, Yes, sir. Please. My question is very simple to all of you. Uh, actually, uh, all right, sir. I was, I was kindly, going to ask. Kindly listen to me. I am the oldest living IITN of India, <coughs> more than 80 years old. First batch graduate IIT Bombay, 1959. M Tech from Imperial College, London. Please listen to this. Human life left on this planet is only 100 years. It took nature 1 million years to raise CO2 level to 200 ppm. Human being has raised this to 420 ppm. No rain in South Africa last three years. Please listen, human, the sea level will rise by three and a half feet. Temperature in Rajasthan, 54 degrees um, centigrade. Please let me complete. Yeah, yes. Benefit well, to all you, of you. Yeah. It 54 degrees centigrade in Rajasthan. Glaciers have melted in Himalayas. Latur, Maratwara, Maharashtra. Owner of 100 acre land is closing his house. Where are you going? 
I will sweep the floor. Why? No rain. In no rain, no water. What do I do with hundred? Please let us hang together. Otherwise, we'll be hanged separately. Now listen. In my country, after seventy years of independence, forty percent illiterate of live of the world live in the bar in the in this country. We have done nothing. If there was Russian Revolution, they dictated. Each one teach one. Fifty-five percent malnutrition children of the world live in my country. Men will born from the female. Fifty-two percent female are anemic. I live in Gurgaon. Opened an anemia clinic. I am so sorry to tell all of you. Seventy-six percent girls in Gurgaon are anemic. We are doing nothing on the ground. We are telling where is social okay. security in this uh, country? Thank you, thank, thank okay, you, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. You nobody would allow me to express my views. I know. <laughs> no, well, I think it's actually. I, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, we had that intervention. I think it's uh, uh, too often we say it's only young people who are concerned about climate change, and it's 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 nice to hear from you know nice to remember that that's not true. Um, the gentleman at the back. Yeah, my, I'm a scholar from Indian School of Public Policy. My question to the panel is that how would do you see how do you see gamification uh, technologies implemented in uh, enterprises? Because millennials are not that much engaged when it comes to the work, and for that you need gamification systems. My second question is uh, to Gautam: Is that uh, how how would you get reskilling done for people who do not? possess the technical education because bots are coming in and works of AI. So how would you look at it from a policy aspect for reskilling of labor? Thank you. And one last question before we go back to the panel. OK, two last I'll come to you. Yes, please go. This is, this is, this is uh, you know, far too much dominance of the IITs. But anyway, please go. <laughs> I'm a professor at IIT Bombay. Um, uh, I'd like to address a question each to Silvana and to Gautam. Uh, my name is Kavi Arya. Um, I'll be speaking this afternoon on, what, uh, on, on something very related at the speed talk at uh, half past six. Um, to Silvana, you s talk about hackathons. I would really like to know what is the impact of hackathons because to me, hackathons don't train you in anything. They're just a measure. They're just an indicator. They're an exam. They're a competitive system, yeah. Yes, but in a context like India, where you have students who don't have basic skills, <laughs> hackathons have very little meaning. OK, hackathon is different if you have guys from Cornell, MIT, and all these guys who are already trained. And they just compete in three days to crystallize an idea. When you have guys who don't have basic skills, hackathons make very little sense. Thank you. I would like to know what your experience is. Lastly, Gotham. A uh, very interesting experiment that you mentioned about uh, connecting startups to the municipality, but I would like to know what happened after that. Okay, thank you. Um, and one last question, and then quick responses from the panel. Really quick responses. Yeah, really Hello, quick everyone. Responses. My name is Nabiha Khan, and my question to the panel is: There is a conventional belief that companies' employees are its biggest asset, but with the advent of fourth industrial revolution, is what are this, What will be the nature of the employees? Whether the data that is considered as the most critical asset of the companies today are going to replace the status or the nature of the company's employees? Okay, thank you. So, will uh, if, you know will the data resources replace HR, HR as the company's the central thing? Okay. Now we have about four or five questions. We have a question on the missing middle class. We have a question on blockchain Latin America. We have a question on uh, hackathons. We have a question on reskilling and gamification. You're welcome to take whichever ones of these you want, but you can see that large sign there. So uh, keep it short. I'll try quickly, uh, okay, Gotham, you go first. Yeah. Kavi. Uh, digital impact or DISQ dot com. Uh, this is dot, uh, just Google it. The success stories and failures are there. So I don't remember them, but they're there. Uh, it wasn't a huge success. We did what we could do. We, we, we funded it and something came out of it. It's all online, number one. Number two, reskilling. We have taken a clear policy within the company that there are legacy technologies, but there are no legacy people. And so everyone is being reskilled. About 300,000 people have been reskilled, uh, and within the organization. So it's a tough mindsets have to change. People who have not studied for a long time have to do have to study again afresh. But you know the alternative is is not a happy alternative either. So uh, we, we, we've taken that challenge. 
on the you, I don't have a fundamental uh, uh, answer. I just know that I, 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 I went to a lecture with Jeffrey Sachs and he said, look, it would be great if everything is automated and just we could just enjoy life and then I could be in a caf uh, you know, cafeteria talking about ethics and philosophy like Plato. But then uh, the question is, we don't know how the economics are going to work. And if Jeffrey Sachs doesn't know, I don't, I don't claim <laughs> to know either. That's all. Yeah. Okay, so that's about um, Sure. Let me maybe take two of the questions at once um, around the how do we reskill and data versus people. So this is really to the question I put to Silvana, and I don't think you need to answer the, be answering that question on your own. Um, how we reskill and how we reframe our economies, I think, is a question that needs to be answered by many different actors who come together in a room um, to answer this question. Like Adam said, I cannot claim to have the answer, but I think what needs to happen as a first port of call is that our entrepreneurs, our government, national and local, academia, big business, um, civil society, need to start strategizing together versus individually to start addressing some of these problems we have. So data as an asset versus people as an asset, you know, I would be very wary to um, say we will eventually live in a world where data is more valued than people. Um, I, I don't think we're at, a, at the risk of that happening. I think what companies are actually asking themselves now is how do we integrate the two to be more efficient or work better together, but I don't think we'll get to a place where we're saying, let's not worry about the people, data is what we need. Silvana. Okay, so I'm gonna be addressing uh, Professor Kavi's question and then the question regarding Colombia. So Professor Kavi, I remember you last year, we had this panel together, we shared, and I absolutely love your question. And let me tell you, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, hackathons, 48 hours hackathons, if you don't have any technological background or previously acquired skills are completely useless unless you're in an environment where, such as MIT or any other technological university. The type of hackathons that we run are different precisely because of that problem. They last more and the price is the least important. The most important thing is all the educational content that, um, that we provide during the hackathon, workshops, academic research content, and uh, different resources that would actually help people acquire blockchain skills while participating. And one of the things that we wanted to always try to address is that precise problem. What if you don't have any technological background? Should you stop competing? And this is a problem even for women. Women have uh, like 5% of participation in the hackathons because we just don't want to take the risk of learning and uh, or we don't have the access to that content. So one of the premises of this type of hackathons is to precisely provide the most uh, high quality educational content that you can within workshops and articles to ensure that people are getting the adequate skills. Now, regarding the question in Colombia, uh, one of the most important case studies on blockchain uh, implementations have been coming from banks. Uh, there, is, uh, there are many Colombian banks that uh, are trying to either recruit or develop uh, technologies through opening the innovations in the form of uh, blockchain implementation. Um, they wanted to implement blockchain to create uh, worldwide users so banking transactions are supposed to be easier and smoother and, and uh, yes, and smoother. And uh, they're trying to do it also by building smart contracts. One of the challenges we do have in Colombia that should be addresses for blockchain and it should be a very interesting use case is corruptions. Let's say voting. How can you track that the vote is coming from a valid source and that there is no bribery or any of these dark things that comes in all these electoral um, uh, events that, that we have in, in countries like in Latin America where corruption is really present. So that's a very big opportunity for blockchain in Colombia. Thank you. And we are almost um, out of time. I have one minute 20 on the clock, so I will just very briefly say in response, one of the, uh, uh, the, the question about the missing middle that uh, uh, the professor asked, this is something, again, that's been running through this conversation. Um, and I think that nobody really talked about the young man who, who said something about gamification in, in work, at workplaces. Um, and 
you know, I believe two things. I believe first that individuals respond to incentives. If young people aren't responding properly to workplaces, it means that they do not see the returns to themselves from for working that hard. All right, and that means that the system is not geared in a way that they feel that they need to put in that kind of work. It's not about making it more apparent. It is about it is about how you change the incentives actually for young people, not about make, making it more fun for them necessarily. Um, and finally, properly designed systems do respond uh, to a vacuum. And if there's a vacuum in the middle of the income distribution, then you're going to see an enormous pull for redistribution of wealth and redistribution of wages. And I think that explains a lot of the politics that we're seeing in those places right now. So uh, thank you very much for turning out. Seven, six, five, four, three. And um, I hope you had a, as good a time as we did. Thank you. Thank you.